Welcome to week 12. Um, this first part is one of the more tricky concepts for students to wrap their brains around. Um, because it just feels weird. Um, I covered it roughly in an hour. Then I'll be spending about half an hour on some more of the week 13 content. Um, yeah. So what we're talking about today is pulling data from more than one table. So, so far, everything you guys have done has been single table queries. Select star from airports. Select star from airports where country ID is 108. And active is true. <laughs> you know, very simple queries. But sometimes you need to pull crap from more than one source. There's two ways of doing it. You have the subquery and the join. They both work with multiple tables, but they serve two different purposes. We're going to start with subqueries. A, if you look at the query that's up on the screen, we're adding up the extended price for all the products that are in water sports. So we have the SKU, that's the list of the products in, this, in water sports. And it's a pretty big list, but the problem with this query is you need to know what the SKUs are. So if you had a new product, you have to add it to this query to get the SKU. If you keep adding lots and lots of products, it gets confusing. Anybody who's worked in retail knows. Shit appears on the shelves one week, next week that shit's not on the shelf, but there's something new on the shelf. Loblaws is, Loblaws is terrible for that. One week he can get fresh udon noodles, and next week it's as if they never sold them in the first place. It's terrible. So, cool, that's one way to do it. So we can actually find out what the SKUs are if we query another table. Also cool. So now we got, you know, we got all these SKUs, somebody pulls out their pen and paper and they start writing all the numbers, right? Or they got the query up on the screen, they start typing all the numbers. Or we can do it as a single query. This is known as a subquery. In math, what do you resolve first when you have an equation? Yeah, litmus, right? Brackets, also known as parentheses. This works the same way. You resolve the query in the parentheses, it will take the results of said query and pass it to the outer query. So I am actually gonna just demonstrate, because you know what? Way easier to demonstrate. Okay, gotta erase that so you guys don't panic yet. Okay. So, so far you guys have experienced this. That's great. But what happens if I want to know what airline is in Canada? So, so far, most of you guys would have gone from countries where name is equal to Canada. So you'd run this query, find out that Canada is 208, and you'd modify your original query to say where country ID is equal to 208. And boom, we have the airlines that operate out of Canada. You could rewrite this as a single query. You could. Uh, and get rid of this. And put a parentheses here. And I'm going to go, I just want the ID. And I'm going to give me the exact same result. Because what this is doing is it runs the inner query. The inner query returns 208. It takes the results of that and substitutes it for this expression. And then suddenly this becomes 208. 
we can do this with a list. So it's very like what's in the slides. And I could go where name is equal to Canada or name is equal to France. I get um, airlines that operate out of Canada. Uh, it's going to be a little challenging to try to find them. They're in here. Uh, if I go look at the country ID. So this is France. And then you got Canada. So what this is doing, two values. It's a list. This list gets passed out to the outer query. The outer query uses that list to finish itself. So that is a subquery used in a where clause. It's used to uh, retrieve data from another table and use it. There are some limitations when you use it like this. Let's say instead of doing select ID, I did a select star. And I hit run. I'll get an error. Compare to one column. This the subquery in this case returns two columns, but you're only comparing it to one column. When you're doing it like this, as when the subquery is part of the where clause, you can that okay. There's operators that let you use more than one column. 99% of the time, you're using one column, which is why we're basically saying it uses one column, just for simplicity's sake. Okay? So, an SQL subquery is often described as a nested query or query within a query, which is demonstrated when I run it because I have a query that is run, then it runs the outer query, so the queries are nested. It is still considered a single table query because you get the result from the outermost query. Like these queries in here are not coming, are not part of the results. They're part of the filter. That's why it's still a single table query because realistically, we're only pulling from airlines. We're just filtering the airlines based on uh, that subquery. Let's make sure my thing is turned on so I don't have that same problem as last week. <laughs> there we go. All right. So subquery can be used multiple times. You can have as many subqueries as you want. You can even nest subqueries inside of other subqueries. They have an example here of a subquery nested inside of a subquery. It'll resolve the one on the inside. Then it'll resolve the next one and finally pass the results to the outside. It's just like when you're doing a, an equation in math. Start from the innermost parentheses or brackets and work your way out from there. Same idea. Okay, so one of the reasons I don't like this particular slide deck, you know I have to use it, is it it's missing two very important topics about subqueries. Remember last week where I said you can't aggregate an aggregate? That sound familiar? Right? So let's just say I wanted to go select average max elevation from airports. So I want to know what the average maximum elevation is for all the airports. This will not let you do it. It'll go your tool. Because you can't nest this. So one of the ways to resolve this was, like last week, you could have used a view. A view of this. And I'm actually going to group this by country ID so that we have you know something a little more useful to work with. All right. So I run this query. And I got an error message because, uh, yeah, I'm just missing a word. There we go. So this is cool. Now, there's another place to use a subquery that is not in the where clause. I can go select star from, 
I'm going to open, oops, wrong one. Open and close. And I'm going to run this. And it's going to look exactly the same. Now people are wondering, well, what's the point? I am going to give, rename this column. Again, exactly the same. If You can do your homework at another time. And they didn't even hear me at all. Yeah. Okay, so what's happening here is I'm running this query, but you notice I gave it a name. What's happening is it takes this query, creates a temporary table in memory. For the lifetime of this query, this data is a table. It's known as a derived table or a virtual table. And what's really cool about this, I can now go average max elevation. And I can now aggregate my aggregate. You will notice that I actually operate against max elevation, not against the math function on the inside, because as far as this query is concerned, this is a table. It looks like a table. It smells like a table. It's not a table. It's a it's a temporary holding bin that has the results of what my previous query was. <laughs> There's all kinds of cool things you can do with this. Uh, you can do math. You can use it to transform the structure of one table or of multiple tables. So then you can transform that data to be put somewhere else. Um, but yeah, it's, you know, one of the common uses for this is for being able to do aggregates on aggregates. There is one other place you can use it. Uh, name, comma, country ID. Country ID. Brown airports. Cool. So I've got the country ID, but let's let's say I want to display the country, but I don't know what the country ID is for each country. You can use a subquery here also. So I can go select name from countries where country dot ID is equal to airports dot country. Score. Oh come on, Dan. ID. All right. And I'm going to run this. And I got an error. Uh, because I suck. Let's try that again. There we go. Okay. So this is known as, well, it's a subquery in the select clause. Okay. Pretty obvious there. But this is known as what's called a correlated subquery. What's happening is it's retrieving every row from airports on row one it will fire off this query and it's going to it's basically going to say hey the country id we have on the outer row we're going to use it for the inner call and then it's literally matching up the countries based on what's in the airports table it's a cute trick it's a very expensive trick Uh, there we go. That was good because I was talking about expensive, which made, it made it almost an exploding sound. So it's good. It was actually appropriate. Um, expensive because every subquery I showed you guys so far, the subquery runs once. And it passes the results on the outside. Did you notice how I worded my previous statement of what it actually does? So what happens is for it'll run the number of rows returned from the outer query. Plus one queries. So 
This has 8,107 rows. It ran 8,108 queries. Because for every subquery we have that's correlated, it needs to run that subquery every single time. So it runs it. Literally row one, run the subquery. Row two, run the subquery. Row three, run the subquery. Now, database servers are really optimized and they're really smart that if it sees that these things are it's a, sub, a correlated subquery, after it's resolved it the first time, it remembers it for the next time it sees that combination, right? So it will be a little bit quicker. But if we look at this, look how long this is taking to run. 381, 365, 368. 365. Now let me take off this uh, subquery. 81 milliseconds. No, you try not to do that if you don't have to. It's handy if you're having a really disparate data set where a lot of the tables don't really line up right, uh, or you're pulling data from multiple different sources of data. Like you have a database full of, you know, data coming from multiple sources that really were not designed as a whole, but you can still use it like that. A common use for this is that like in the insert statements actually. So for example, I want to go insert into customers uh, values um, name comma province ID, right? And we could go, uh, no, that's not valid. That's um, values comes after taking a braid fart. I go values and I could go uh, Bob. Then I could go select ID from provinces where name is equal to Ontario. I never need to know what Ontario's ID is because this query is able to resolve it. This is not a correlated subquery, by the way, because it's not referring to anything on the outside. So it only runs once. Well, it's a single list system, so it's only run once, but it would run once. So if you ever wonder how, when people are creating large data sets at the beginning and they have a list of countries, they have a list of provinces or a list of statuses being brought in, but you don't know what all these IDs are, they're, they're not gonna sit there and go create, actually, I know people that do this. They'll create a map of each ID and then before they create the insert statement, they'd actually write code to actually populate all the IDs. Or you could do it like this and never have to think about it. So this is the power of the subqueries that, like the last couple of things I showed you guys is not in the slides. So that means it's not in the labs. Well, the drive table is. But the like drive table is not gonna be on the exam as far as I remember, I have to double check. And definitely this is not gonna be on the exam. But this is a cute trick. Um, it's a really handy trick. But the important one is in the where clause, because that's apparently according to, the, according to the slides and whoever put these slides together, that's how you use subqueries. Um, they actually have significantly more purposes than that, but they're often used in the where clause. Like I'd say that's like 90% of the places subqueries get used is in the where clause, so it's valid. But, you know, these are cute tricks. Okay, now to move on to joins. Okay, so in an SQL join operation, the join operator is used to combine parts or all of two or more tables in the same database. Obviously, you guys know data is stored in separate tables. You've been playing with the flight DB for a while now. You have airports, you have airlines, you have aircraft, you have routes. You have an intersection table between a route and the aircraft. You have a country that basically populates both countries. I mean, countries that populate both airports and airlines. Data is all over the place. We can actually connect those tables and retrieve data from all those tables at the same time to make the results more meaningful. Um, there's a thing called explicit join where the join keyword is used. And you have implicit joins where the keyword is not used. This is suddenly where this whole slide deck is a shit show because it jumps around like 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 a kid on sugar. 
Um, so there's a bunch of kinds of joins. I'm actually going to talk about all of these when I do my demonstrations. But we have natural joins, inner joins, left, right, outer joins, and full, also known as cross joins. Joins can be used on tables, views, and materialized views. And since it was not included in the previous slides, you can also use them on derived tables. So you know that little that little subquery I created as in the from clause? You can actually join, use that in a join too. Because once it's in memory, it's a table. It only exists for the lifetime of the query, but it's a table. So it works. All right. So natural joins. So a natural join joins based on the common attributes between tables. So if two tables have the same column name with the same data type, a natural join will try to connect the results from those two tables using that. Unique columns are returned once, any duplicate columns are discarded. If there's no column names, the natural join turns into a Cartesian product, also known as a cross join. The syntax for a natural join is select star from table one, natural join table two. That's using the explicit join syntax. This is using the implicit join syntax. Select star from table one comma table two. Now, let me explain to you why natural joins are stupid. No, natural joins were smart with how databases used to be written. Those were joins for lazy people who don't actually want to know the structure of the database. Because the common way of designing databases was if you had a table called customer, the primary customers, the primary key would be called customer underscore ID or customer ID or whatever. And then the foreign key would also be customer underscore ID with the same data type. Therefore, the database server would look at customers, oh, primary key is customer ID, Table two, huh? There's a field in here called customer ID. We're going to use that to join. Done. Guy writing SQL doesn't need to know any better. It just did it for them. Until it just so happens that both tables also have a column called state ID. So now it's going to go, oh, we're going to go across customer ID. Oh, and we also have state ID. So we're going to join across state ID also. Those might not match anymore. They might not even have the same value. On the customer, state ID might literally be, you know, what state they live in. On the order, it could be, what state is the order in? Is it shipped? Is it received? Is it paid? The, the data means nothing, but if the fields have the same data type and the same name, it's going to use those too. They're terrible because you're literally letting the computer decide what it's going to do. How well has it worked for everybody in this room, allowing your computer to do whatever it feels like it wants to do? HP users, you know what I'm talking about. HP, HP laptop, I'm going to update my BIOS. Oh, time to buy a new laptop. I wish I was laughing. I have history with HP laptops. There's a reason I have a very big hate on for them. Um, I had a laptop at work who got RMA three times because the BIOS update fried it every time using HP's official software with their official BIOS. Just brick, really expensive piece of aluminum and plastic. Okay, so they're not a good thing. Don't use natural joins because you're just rolling the dice and hoping whoever designed the database was ultra competent. And they made sure that every column is unique in the entire database, except for foreign keys. And the other rule of programming, never assume the other guy did a good job. Just like, you know, rule number three of programming, the user always lies. Rule number four, the managers only up for themselves. 
There's a lot of lessons in this class. Eh? Oh, I've got so many, it's not funny. But those are the big ones. Um, so, this is an example of an implicit join. Essentially, the way it works is you have your select like you always have. You have your from using a comma. Then you have every table you want to join in a list. And then you have the points of commonality in the where clause. So when I learned SQL 27 years ago, ish, maybe closer to 28, um, this is the only way we could do joins. This was the syntax for joins. There's a problem with this method of doing joins. The way the database server works is when it sees something in the from clause, it reads the entire table before it operates on the where. So from table one, one million rows, comma table two, one million rows, comma table three, one million rows. What just happened? We just loaded three million rows in memory. And then we're going to do the where and go, oh, we don't need this one, we don't need this one, we don't need this one, we don't need this one. It's gross. It's not very logical. This is known as an implicit join. It would look, you know, supposedly like this. I am going to uh, highlight a few other things in a minute. Um, so this, this slide deck's like all over the place. So when tables are used, joined using equal conditions, so in this case, in this slide where the order numbers match, it's known as an equal, equal join. And in other words, a join where both sides are equal to each other. Order number is equal to order number. Yes. Okay, these rows belong together. Order number does not equal to order number. No, this row does not belong together. So it literally goes through the entire list and lines up the other ones with each other. Um, I'm going to demonstrate all this in a second. It's going to make way more sense. And this is joining two tables, which I'm going to go to the join on. So everything about this whole implicit join, pretend I didn't even say it. It's not on the test. I've fought with them about re removing that content from the slides just to save content. And they always say, well, that's how it used to be done, so they should know about it in case they see it. Cool. Don't give, don't bring back my PTSD from when I went through school. The other issue is sometimes you go to Google and you ask it to how to do a join in SQL, and for some unknown reason, Google decides to reach into its dark depths, stir things around, and pulls out an answer somebody answered 15 years ago using the old syntax. And the student goes and uses that. And then they lose points on their lab because they wonder why. Because, you know, they're using something that's considered eh. So the modern way of doing this, by, by the word modern, I'm talking like 1997 was when this was introduced. I think it might have been 1990. Yeah, 97, because I they didn't have it in 96 when I went through school. So 97, 98 is when they brought this in to the party. And they made it official in SQL 99. So 1999. This is like new technology, which is actually, you know, older than some people in this room. So the SQL join keyword is placed between table names in the from clause. It gets rid of the comma. The on keyword is also in the from clause and it replaces what's in the where clause. Since the where clause is no longer used as part of the join, it makes it easier to understand what's actually being used to filter the data because the where clause has been simplified. The on clause is clear because it makes it clear what's actually being connected to what. The explicit join on syntax is consistently, consent, consent, blah, currently considered the proper way. And that's another thing I don't like about the slide says like they're going to come up with something new. 
they came up with this 24 years ago. It's It's been working for 24 years. It's not going away. So it is the proper way to write a join. The old syntax is considered archaic, old, but as typical database developers, like the people that write the database software, they go, hey, there's some really old code out there. We can't break how it used to be done. So we're going to allow that old shitty code to keep running, which is cool because some of this old shitty code is running banks. And a lot on your taxes, <laughs> the government, you know, because, you know, it is what it is. So <clears throat> this is the join syntax. Um, and this is where I'm going to stop using the slides. I'm going to start just demoing it piece by piece because the slides are just no easy. All right. Uh. Okay. So let's go back to our... Um, Star from airports. Actually, no, I don't want that much data. I'm going to go name, comma, city from airports. Okay. Run. Query works. Good job, Dan. Now, let's just say I want to include the country. So, of course, so far, you know, we go country ID. Cool. We know the ID of the country. That's not very useful. Well, it might be useful to the programmer, but, you know, not very useful to Johnny. Johnny's looking at this, he goes, I don't know what country that is. So we this is where the whole join syntax comes, comes in. So I'm going to go join countries on airports.country underscore ID is equal to countries.id. And I am going to include uh, name again. So now I'm going to cause an error. Don't panic. I know this error is coming. I'm going to hit run. And it's going to say column reference name is ambiguous. Now, those of you with a solid understanding of the English language, what does this mean? Eh? Yeah. The computer doesn't know which name you want. And it being conservative by default, it goes, I don't know what you want, so you know what's going to happen? No soup for you. Fix your, fix it. So the way you fix it is you prefix ambiguous names with the name of the table you want from. So I want the airport name and the country's name. And now I'm going to run it. And now I've got countries. Nice and clean. Now I can get rid of my country ID because I don't need that anymore. And we've got ourselves a fairly handy little query. And now we can actually get a little fancier. We could literally go where countries.name in Canada, comma, France. So I want to know the airports in Canada and France. Bam. So if I sort through this, eventually we'll hit France. There it is. See, so there's some France mixed into the Canadas. So let me explain to you what's actually happening here. So it's grabbing everything from airports. So it says, I want everything from airports. Now I'm going to connect countries on and then I tell it, this is the point of commonality between these two tables. With the old way of writing it, you would have had airports.countryid is equal to countries.countryid. This is where it's important to refer to your ERD. Because your diagram will tell you how things are connected. <laughs> Excuse me. Now, there was a diagram included with, la with the lab where you got the SQL file for this or the backup file. Postgres is kind enough. And I'm being very facetious when I say kind to allow you to generate an ERD. Anybody who's done this so far will know exactly how terrible this is going to look. There. It's a really ugly diagram. But 
one thing that this diagram does well is a concept called connect keys. You'll notice that when it shows the foreign key that it actually lines up the little the, the little crow's foot with the actual column. So you can see that this primary key, which is really not, it shows that this primary key connects to this, this primary key connects to this. So you can at least use the built-in diagram to figure out what the foreign keys are. The database guy was competent and actually created foreign keys. Just, just saying, you know, um, so what's happening is why this is more performant than the implicit join is it's actually filtering the results here on the join before it ever hits the where. <laughs> so this means um, that this countries.name is only operating on countries that actually have airports, which in this database, all the countries have airports, but you know, if I was operating with other stuff, the results would be less, so the where clause has less stuff to work against. That's one of the good things about work with doing the join like this, is that every, by the time you reach the where clause, your joins have reduced the amount of data the database needs to work with. And anybody here who's ever had to deal with big piles of paper knows that if you can get rid of half the pile of paper, the rest of it's gonna go a lot faster because you have less stuff to look at. All right, so you can join multiple call tables at the same time. So I'm gonna change to, no, actually I'm gonna leave that one there. I'm gonna go join um, roots on roots dot uh, destination, destination, oh my God. Airport ID is equal to, airports.id. So now I'm going to throw in the roots ID. And you'll see that there's multiple roots with looks like the same data over and over and over again. However, now I'm going to go join airlines on airlines.id is equal to roots.airlineid. You will notice that the order on this side is not important. Like, it doesn't make a difference which one you put on each side of the equal sign. It just has to be a complete equal sign. And now I'm gonna throw in airlines.name. Oh, that wasn't even useful. Uh, am I actually doing that right? Hang on. Where countries dot name is equal to Canada. I did this earlier and I swear it didn't look like this. Did I? No, no, it's right. Okay. Whew. Um, I do this for a living and I was confused with myself for a second. So here is showing the name of the airport. Well, actually, I can rename this for you uh, as airport, as country as airline. So this is the port in the Sault Ste. Marie's original. There's airports to St. Marie Airport. Um, the destination airport ID, just so you know, go to lab nine, you're gonna be playing with this. So source airport ID, plane takes off. Destination airport ID, plane lands, okay? That might be a really hard concept to wrap your head around. Source, you go up, destination, you're going down. So these are routes that end in Sault Ste. Marie, and these are the airlines that land there. This is a useful query. It's useful, it's real data. It's something that's, you know, actionable, as they say. As you can see, you can join as many tables as you want. It makes no difference. Um, I mean, you can join, I literally, I can go all the way in, go uh, routes, root aircrafts on root aircrafts dot 
root ID join air aircrafts on aircrafts dot ID is equal to root aircrafts dot aircraft ID and I'll make it column for everybody's enjoyment aircraft dot name as plane drop that to another word. and I'm gonna go run and I got a typo uh, okay so this is an error message you guys might see in your labs um, last this on purpose I just actually did it by accident this time um, let's see argument of to go and what does that mean it's because i don't have a valid boolean expression if you'll notice the rest of this is boolean expressions right where the airline id matches the root airline id this one here doesn't have that so if i go um roots dot id and i run it again i got another problem uh missing from yeah aircraft Helps if you use the right table names. All right. Now we know which which airline lands in Sault Ste. Marie and what kind of plane they're using to land. So if ever you go to the airport and it shows, you know, the airline landing shows what aircraft that's what they're doing behind that that screen that never works. It's literally this. Um by the way, in case you guys are curious, this flight DB was real data. Um, there's this website that used, uh, that's called FlightAware. They used to actually publish their database once a year. So their data was always one year out of date. But it was real data. These real airports, real airlines, real routes, real aircraft that flew on those routes from 10 years. This is real world data. So this is all cool data you can play with. So this is just to show that you can literally, I have literally joined almost every table in this database to give you this nice little report. It's kind of cool. Now, an actual, uh, get a little fancier and go and city equal to Toronto. Now we can see a city center airport. There's Lester B. Pearson. Um, that just goes to show how many planes are landing in Toronto at any given time, you know. Um, actually, if I did, instead of aircraft name, I did aircraft description. Um, you can see which, actually, which kind of plane model it is that's landing. Um, so this is cool. So this is an equijoin. So and, and essentially everything that's in the table has to match on both sides. This is the type of join that you will use 99% of the time. 99.5% of the time even. Like literally, this is the join that people, when somebody says, I want you to join two tables, this is what they're talking about. Now, there's other kinds of joins. And I am going to take this long query, copy it, Go to Notepad++, paste it, because I'm going to paste all these queries for you guys later in the announcement, if, as long as I remember to do it when I get home. Okay. So I'm not going to, I'm going to simplify this a little bit. And I am going to go back to, um, I'm just going to keep routes and airports like this. And I am to, oh, uh, no, I don't need airlines. And airports. Um, and I'm going to go airports name, airport city, and uh, root I, uh, roots .id. Okay, so we came back. Simple query here. Boom. Now, we have this. But 
we call you is are called inner joints. You can, the word inner is optional. We have things called outer joints, left and right outer joints. And I am going to go order by root ID. And I'm going to hit run. And I don't know why, but I'm having real problems tonight. Okay. So this looks good. 72,000 rows. Right now you don't see. So let me just do this join first without the left. 67, 421 rows. The left join and run it. I have 72,000 rows. Now people are going to go, well, what's, what's happening? So you know what? Everything from the left table and any matches you have on the right table. If you have no matches on the right, I want you to give me null values. And I can demonstrate that very quickly. Order by root ID, descend order. The database will always sort nulls to the end. And now we have airports in a city with null IDs. We still have the same number. I'm just changing the sort order. So is SQL interpreter. Even though this is on multiple SQL interpreter reads all to write. This is left. This semicolon is right. Because it ignores carriage returns. So if I were to put this all on one line, it's really become a but what it, it reads left to right. Okay, so we got this big long query, and it does the exact same thing, but it's all on one line because it works from left to right. Join is saying I want everything from here. Left join roots. So it says when it's a left join, it wants everything from airports and any matches it finds in roots. If it doesn't find a match, it returns a null value instead. Now, at this point, people will go, well, what's the point? Imagine you've got a really big product catalog, Amazon, for example, and you want to know what products never sold. So you could do select star from products, left join order lines, and sort by something. And it'll give you all the products you ever had, plus all the order lines. But if it doesn't find an order line, it gives you a null. And what's cool about this is we can actually where roots.id is null. And I go, go. And now I have 4,832 rows returned instead of 72,000. It's returning only the airports that are never used as a destination. Because if it had an, a root ID, because I'm, I'm joining on, notice I'm joining on destination, right? So I am joining on destination, but then I'm saying I want all the airports plus any routes you find that match, any routes that don't match, do as a null. Now I'm saying where the root ID is null, it's now suddenly saying, well, therefore I only want to know where there is no match. If I did that with a product catalog, select everything from products, join order lines, left join order lines, where, product, where the order line ID is null, that will give me the list of products that never sold. And those get trimmed. Because Amazon want to keep crap in their store if it doesn't sell. So that is a left join. There's also one called a right join. Can somebody guess what the right join does? It does the opposite. So it'll give me everything from roots. So if I did a right join like this, which I don't know if actually it's work. Let's try it. Um, get rid of this where clause. And uh, order by airport 
ID. This worked. So this is giving me all the routes that are um, only used, uh, they're never used as a destination. So these are the root IDs that are never used as a destination. Only going up. No, never down. Um, which is kind of nifty because apparently there's air, airline routes that go up, but they never come back down. Those are those are airlines that go up and come back to the same airport, you know, tours and stuff like that. All right, so left and right joins used maybe 0.4% of the time. It's an important concept to know. And the other group asked me, when do you know when you should use a left or right join? You'll know when you need to use a right and left join when you need to use it. Like it's going to be one of those moments where you're going to go, this is not doing what I needed to do. I wonder why I can't get X, Y, Z. Because the regular inner join doesn't do the job, you need a left or a right join. And the last bit that I want to talk about joins is the full join, the Cartesian join. Um, I created a temporary table just for this set of tables in another database because I can't do it in the flight DB. Okay, so in this database, I have um, some suites or suits, and I have a face value. Okay, so basically, it's a deck of cards. And what the Cartesian join will do is if I join uh, join 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 query from this um, eh? oh sorry um, full join actually let me use the comma that's I hate the comma but this will work better just for this example. That's what it does. Actually, let me switch these around so that's a little more obvious. Okay. It does a Cartesian join. You guys remember Cartesian joins in high school math? Vaguely talk about matrices? Does that ring a bell, high school math? Okay, good. At least one person here remembers high school. Two. The other group only had one, so this you guys are... 100% better than the previous group. So this is a concept that's almost useless in database. There's really no reason to do this unless you're trying to build a matrix. And a matrix is literally when you do every value joined to every other value. So I had four suits and six face values. How many rows did I get back? 24. Four times six is because it's literally going to go clubs one, hearts one, diamonds one, spades one, clubs two. It literally joins everything to everything else if you don't tell it. That's a natural join. That's also a cross join because there's no commonality between them. Um, it's a cute trick. I've been doing this for 27 years. I've never used this. But it's mentioned in the slides. So I mention it as part of the lecture. Okay. Okay, so SQL join on three or more tables. Cool. Yeah, more. So this slide's just talking about how it just lines up the values. I don't know, somebody tried to make a clever visual of it and it's flat. Uh, then they tried to use a Venn diagram, which is not what this is supposed to be used for. <laughs> this is why I don't use these slides. Um, but read through these slides for the for the exam because, you know, some of the Terminology in here is actually valid. It's just the way it's presented as shit. Um, again, the Venn diagram again. That's the left outer join, which I just demonstrated. Um, basically, it's saying left outer join returns all records from the left table and only matching records from the right table. When there's no matches from the right, also known as the second table, it returns a null value. And then they give you an example. Then they spend a whole slide on the right join with an example. So comparing subqueries of joins. Subqueries and joins process multiple tables. A subquery can only be used to retrieve data for 
the top table. I don't know why it says from, it's for the top table. An SQL join can be used to obtain data from any number of tables, including the topmost table in the query. Okay, so back to, back to uh, this is the last topic, um, not in the labs. I don't remember if it's on the exam. I have to go through the exam. I got the draft this morning. So anybody here remember set theory in math class? Usually it's the international students that remember this because their math courses are more rigorous than Canadian math courses as a rule of thumb. So good database servers support all three set operations. MySQL does not. So when we talk about set theory, some of this stuff might be familiar. So it uses Venn diagrams because that's what Venn diagrams are for. They're for sets. Some of us of a certain vintage will remember when there's a bunch of memes using Venn diagrams was fooling around the internet. They were really pixelated because, you know, everything was pixelated, you know. We all know this Venn diagram, you know, you got a circle with, you know, lady and you got a circle with cats and then you got the insect with the cat lady. And that's politically incorrect nowadays. It's person, cat person, but you know, I have four cats, so I get to make that joke. I'm a cat person, um, unfortunately. <laughs> but so that's what Venn diagrams are for. A set is labeled circle, a subset's a portion that is contained within that set could be entirely contained inside that set. So a union of two sets, and I've actually got Venn diagrams in the following slides for this, which will make it way more, make it more sense. Um, the union of two sets represents a set that contains all the values from set one plus any values in set two that aren't in set one. Basically, it's the unique values from both sets put together. An intersection of the two sets is the values that only exist in both sets. Cat person. The complement is anything in A that is not in B. Sorry, anything, everything in A that is, literally, anything in A that is not found in B. In other words, anybody who is not a cat person. All right, here are the slides. Make the Venn diagram. So you got set A, set B. The first slide doesn't apply to set theory because set B is fully contained in set A. Cool. The first one's the union. So set A plus anything it finds in set B. So basically it gives you everything, just a unique copy of each thing. The intersection gives you only what's common between the two. The complement, what they what they in math they call a complement, is whatever is in A excluding anything in B. There are some limitations when you use set operations. Um, you'll notice I'm not even doing examples because there's no lab for it. So I'm just making sure it's covered. The table involves must have the same number of columns. You can't compare two different sets. So set A has three columns, set B has two columns. You can't compare them because they don't have the same structure. Each of the columns being compared must be the same data type. You can't compare an integer to a string because an integer is not a string. So if you've got column A as a, as a string, column B is an integer, set B must be string integer. It compares the entire set of values being returned. They have to be the same data type. Um, the operators is union, which is well, union, intersect, which is intersect. And they decide instead of calling it complement, they, Microsoft SQL Server and Postgres and IBM DB2 use except, Oracle uses minus, which also makes sense. I prefer except because so give me everything from this side except what you find here. Oracle says, I'm gonna be a little mathy today. Everything from A minus whatever we find in B. In the end, it's the same thing. What does it actually look like when you write it as a query? Um, actually, I, I'm just gonna go to the last slide. There we go. All right, so here's the three examples, and you'll notice they all use the exact same set of queries. So 
When you do a set operation, it actually uses multiple queries. Select first name, last name from customer, union, first name, last name from employee. So that's going to say, give me all the customers and any employee that's not a customer. So it gives you a unique version of everything. Sucks if you're an employee that also has the same name as a customer. You're not going to get included because it's only the unique value. So it grabs everything from the first set and anything unique from the second set and gives you the full thing together. Intersect will give me any customer that's also an employee, assuming, you know, that the names are completely unique. The third one will give me customers, but no employees. So any customer, as long as their name's not the same as one of our employees. So we wanted to run a promo, and as long as your name's not the same as one of our employees, you get to have the promo. That is the set theory. It is what it is. Um, this is actually something I use on a regular basis, but you don't need it until you know you need it. It's one of those things where I actually didn't use this for the first 10 years of my career. And then one day I needed to use it. Then like, I swear to, after I needed it the first time, it just kept showing up to the party after that. Why? Because I was working with more and more complex data. Uh, often these kinds of operations are used in mailing lists. So you have a, keep an eye on my time. So you have a customer database with a bunch of email addresses. Suddenly, you decide to be one of those companies who bites and buys an email list from sketchy email list vendor A. And you want to run a mailer for all of your customers plus anybody in this list. Now, you don't want to send the same email to the same person multiple times. So you would do a union because it would only give you the unique email address from both piles. Intersect. You want to send emails to only customers that are also in this list you purchased. Maybe you, like when I say a sketchy list, some of these lists are like industry lists. Like um, back in the day when people bought magazines, especially computer magazines, um, when you signed up, you also gave them the implicit permission to sell your email address. So a company like Microsoft would buy a mailing list from PC World Magazine and from Byte Magazine so they could run promotions targeting these people. But maybe we want to only send promotions to people that bought these magazines. So Microsoft would use an intersect. You know, all our customers that we know but only the ones that have bought these magazines. Except we want to send out a promo to anybody except the ones that bought this magazine. So that's where you use set operations. That's the kind of stuff you use it for. You can use it for really math intensive stuff, but you know, that's a very common use for it. Okay. No, we're not done for today. Before you start packing your shit. Okay. Uh, no, not this topic. That's next week. Indexes. <clears throat> okay, so this is, and why is it not uh, PowerPoint? Wait, why you be this way? Okay, cancel this. We're on the current slide. Anyways, we're going to live with my taskbar. PowerPoint's having a moment. So. Indexes. So most queries require only a small amount of data from a database. That's cool. The problem is, if the only way to get the data would be to scan the entire database, that'd be terrible. So indexes are a way to help us speed this up. And I use a very real world example. And the last group made me very sad. How many of you have been to a library in your life? Hot damn, you guys are so much better. The other group was like 50%. Okay, now picture you go into, so when you go to the library and you want to find a book, you walk in, you go up to the little computer, you type some stuff in, it doesn't find anything. You walk over to the library and go, hey, can you help me find this topic? Librarian doesn't touch a computer. Librarian just walks and goes, it's over here, right? 
because they pr basically have the entire library indexed in their head. Now, the way database servers work with the data is, if it does have an index, I'm gonna be getting into what indexes actually are in a minute. It does what's called a table scan. Row one, does it meet the criteria? Row two, does it meet the criteria? Row three, does it meet the criteria? Row one million and one, does it meet the criteria? Fun times. Now, the thing is, is that even it finds the criteria it doesn't stop because it might find more of the criteria of the table. So it has to do a, what they call a full table scan. Picture the library where none of the books have the Dewey Decimal Code on it. And the books are randomly arranged on the shelves. Romeo and Juliet, a physics textbook, Barney, a book about fishing, Game of Thrones. There's a million books. You need to find a book about sedimentary rocks. How are you going to find that book? You're literally going to go shelf by shelf, book by book, until you find the book you need. That's a table scan. They create a Dewey Decimal System to make it organized. Indexes is like the Dewey Decimal System plus the helpful librarian. So the other analogy they use here, which I find is so much more boring, is a textbook. You guys all know what a textbook looks like, I hope. You need to find a topic in the textbook, you open the back, you look in the index, and you go find the word, and you go find the page for it. Database server does basically the same thing. So primary keys are indexed by default. That's why primary key lookups are fast, because by default, they are indexed. Nothing else is indexed by default, just the primary keys. Um, so Primary keys, the most common, no, sorry, not primary keys, indexes, the most common style of index is known as a B plus tree. For years, I thought it was called a binary tree. For years. And then at a conference years ago, I ran into a data scientist. And the other groups asked me, should you actually believe what he said? I go, well, dude had several PhDs in data management science. And he actually worked on indexes. So I'm not going to argue with what it means. You, anybody here want to guess what B stands for? It's going to hurt your soul. No. Best. Best tree index. Why? Because he had other indexes methods before, and the, B, the best tree method was considered the best way of doing an index. So they called it a B tree because I guess at one point somebody says, man, that looks really terrible. So we better call this B tree so we can make it a little vague. I don't know. Um, all right. So the way B trees work is it takes the values, subdivides it up to four layers deep. A B tree can only ever go four layers deep. Postgres has an H tree, a heuristic tree. It can go to 25 layers deep. That's because it's designed for handling really big data. Everybody else basically uses B tree because it's good enough, because it's the best tree. <laughs> Sorry. So let's let's say we played a game of guess the number between one and one hundred. What's your first guess? No, it's fifty. It should always be fifty. Your first guess. At that point, the response is higher or lower. I say lower. So what's your next guess? Lower. Well, now you and I are playing the game now. Okay. So if it's lower than 25, what's the next number? Sure. 12. Because it's less than 25, so it's 24 divided by 2, right? 12. Lower. So now at this point, we've gone down four layers. How many numbers, and it's lower than six, so how many numbers do we need to look at to get the answer? Yeah, five. Instead of looking at 100 rows, you're looking at five. 
you did four jumps and now you're down to five things you need to look at. That's how the B tree works. But it also does it with alphabet, letters. So what the way it manages it is like this. So it'll do A to F, uh, G to, I forgot what came after F for a second, okay? I'm a little tired. So G to uh, whatever is between P, the middle between P and Z. And then you got from that point to Z. So you could go, you know, A to F, G to M, N to S, T to Z. That would divide it in four. Then you could take each of those and divide it again. So the way it decides it's going to do it is it looks at how much data, and that's how it figures out how much dividing it needs to do. So in this case, we're looking for flyers. So we know it's less, it's equal or less to F. So we'll go into the first set. We know it's F, so it's not in A or B. It's not in C or D. It must be in E or F. And it'll go down into E or F. In this case, it's only needed two layers and we only need F flyers. It's the only data we have. So that's how indexes work on the inside. Like they actually have entire university courses on indexes. There's a lot of math, but for all intents and purposes, that's all you need to know is you create an index, shit happens and it's magic. And that's how it works on the inside. So you can have unique indexes and non-unique indexes. Primary keys are always unique indexes because you do not want duplicate values. You can create unique indexes for non-key fields. For example, email. You don't want the same email address to go into the system twice. You can create a primary key for that. If you try to insert it in there again, you get an error message. It also make looking up email addresses lightning fast. For non-unique indexes, you use on stuff that you search against often, phone numbers, email address, zip codes, product codes, SKUs, that kind of stuff. Uh, for those of you that don't never worked retail, a SKU is a product code. It's right next to a UPC, which is the barcode. Uh, for those of you that are curious, the UPC, the UPC is the barcode. 4011 is the SKU for bananas. That's the only one I remember, okay? I used to actually, I used to be able to go and not even look because I, you know, I used to do all my shopping myself. I actually had to excuse for almost all the produce memorized. So I'd just go up and I was as fast as the cashiers putting in all my groceries. Bag. So people don't need to remember them. Um, 25, 132 is uh, Kaiser Rolls. Don't ask me, well, how come I remember that? But I do. I can't remember phone numbers. I remember what Kaiser rolls are. Uh, those are the ones with sesame buns, sesame seeds on top. That's so important to remember. So I said I have nice Kaiser roll sandwich with sesame seeds on top, white bread. Anyways, so non-unique indexes are created on stuff you'd look up re regularly. Like maybe a person's last name would be indexed because maybe you do searches often by last name. The two uh, syntaxes is create unique index, whatever you call it, on table with whatever column is being applied. If you don't want to do create unique, it's not a unique index, you just drop the unique, key, the unique keyword. So it's just create index. You may look at this and it looks very familiar to the syntax of creating a primary key constraint. So instead of create constraint, give it a name, primary key. With that, it's create index this on those fields. All right. And here's a simplified version of that slide. I don't know why we have it twice. All right, so there are a few gotchas when it comes to um, indexes. So you can create multi-column indexes. Cool. So let's say you have two fields you search together regularly. Um, <clears throat> a common one you see is um, last name and city. Um, you know, did you ever go to a place where they ask you for your last name? They don't ask you for your phone number. They should look you up by last name first. Um, vets are very common for that. They'll look you up by name before they, or they'll look you up by phone number. Um, I'm trying to remember because I just had this experience not long ago where they asked me for my name and not anything else. 
Yeah, member. All right, so well, you can create multi-column indexes. So this one, this example is creating a two-column index on a table called person. So we're going to index by age and city. <clears throat> that query will help with select star from person where age is 55 and city is equal to Seattle. It'll work. But it will not help for the second one or select star from person where city is equal to Seattle. Because the way indexes work is the query optimizer, because that's a thing. So the you write your query, you send it to the server. The server parses the query to make sure there's no syntax errors. No syntax errors. It then goes to what's called the optimizer. The optimizer figures out the best way to pull the data out of the database. It looks at what's in the where clause or the joins or whatever else. And it says, do I have any indexes that match this field or subset of these fields? And it tries to find the best matching index. So in this case, we created a single index. It has two columns. The second query only has one column. Therefore, it won't find a match in the indexes. Therefore, it's going to do a table scan. Because the way the, I don't know exactly the mechanics of how the index is built, but you can't use a single column against a multi-column index. It just doesn't work. On the other hand, if we flip to this concept the other way around, where we create a single column index on city, it would help with the multi-clause where because city is include is a single column and it's you know there's a match in there of a of a criteria that matches what the index is covering. So it would reduce everything down to Seattle and then do a table scan of the rest to figure out the 55. So it would grab all the Seattles first and then just scan those to find 55. It'll still be faster than the table scan, but not as efficient as the compound index. Okay, so this is where I'm going off script for a little bit. What time is it? Yes, I got lots of time. There's a few things about indexes that aren't covered in these slides that I normally cover. This is a for your own edification. For those of you that don't know what that word means, I'm going to teach you something. I'm then discovering that some young people don't have a very good vocabulary anymore. So indexes are great so far, right? Um, I have a perfect example of how good they can be. Um, last place I worked, um, we have a programmer that writes really shitty queries and it does terrible database design work. It's best part, he inherited my job. But anyways, uh, I'm not supposed to be happy about that. Um, but anyways, so he wrote this one chunk of code with a really messy query, no indexes in sight for the most part. User would hit the web page, 10 minutes. Database server, 85% usage for 10 minutes. Most of you guys are thinking, eh, 10 minutes isn't that long. Okay, how many people in this room, when a web page takes a little long, you hit the button again? Hit refresh. This is what was happening. So there's only three people using this web page. Two of them would hit it at the same time. Things are a little slow. They hit the button again. And again, so now suddenly it's trying to run this super sloppy query three times in parallel. CPU is now spiking to 100%, which means nobody else can use the server right now. This is a server that serves up license information to our customers. Customers are down. That's why I was kind of giggling a minute ago when I was thinking of how I don't have to deal with that stuff anymore. So. Now, does anybody here ever work ever work with Amazon, AWS? Ever play in AWS? No? Okay. So in AWS, the way it works is you have a database instance. You get something called CPU credits. So you get baseline performance. If you have a sudden spike in usage, it will lend you credits so you can use more CPU time to improve this performance of your query. The CPU credits kick in at 30%. What happens if the database server goes to 100%? It's eating CPU credits. What happens when you run out of CPU credits? It runs at the slowest speed that that server can offer, which means as big expensive queries are gonna run even slower because it's got less horsepower. So 
after I told him to fix this shit several times, and he did not, I decided I'm going to go take a look at this. I spent 10 minutes, created three indexes. It went from 10 minutes to 14 seconds. Not my problem anymore. But 14 seconds. I walked out of I'm going, bruh. Fine, this is not your forte. I know it's not your strong point, but you could have spent 10 minutes doing this. And even if you did only half of what I did, it would have improved it dramatically. Anyways, so then I like, and then two days later, I was off to a new job. <laughs> but anyways, so that's the performance increase you can get from indexes. Amazing performance comes at a cost. Three costs. Cost number one, the first, Thing that a lot of junior database people will do is go, I'm going to index all the things. I'm going to create like compound indexes, individual indexes, lots of indexes. Sounds like a good plan, right? Until the query optimizer gets confused. It goes, there's more than one index that satisfies this. I don't know which one I'm going to do. Hmm. Well, I'm programmed to be very conservative in my decision making. I'm going to do a table scan. I don't need indexes. Those are for the plebs. I'm going to do this one at a time through the whole library, one book at a time, because it can't find the librarian. It can't decide which librarian he wants to go talk to. There's three. Doesn't know which one's going to do the job. To hell with it. I'll just look it up myself. Okay, that's cost number one, bad design. It can cause performance issues because it gets overcomplicated. Problem number two. Indexes have to be stored. They take up room. They don't take up room as much as the original table. So let's say our table is one megabyte. Yes, it's a very small table, one megabyte. And one index is 100K. Cool. So we're using 1.1 megabytes. Programmer buddy decides, I'm going to create lots of indexes. We have 10 indexes at 100K each. We're up to two megabytes for this table, and the queries are going to suck because it doesn't know which one to use. We're doubling our disk space. That's cost number two. Now, of course, we all have these computers with lots of disk space. Yay. If you're in a cloud environment, you're paying for that disk space. It's not like they give you disk space for free. Uh, I know for a Postgres database on Amazon for a 100 gigabyte, uh, allocation, it's uh, $37 a month. Doesn't sound like much. It sounds like a lot to students. For an enterprise, it doesn't sound like much. Then you have 100 databases. You're now it's up to $3,700. Those costs add up. Space is expensive. Even though we think it's cheap, it's expensive. But the last one is the kicker. And I'm going to grab all my dead little batteries here for my example. The last one is I.O. operations. How many of you know what an I.O. operation is? Okay, good. A few people. Input-output operations, also known as read-write. Okay. I have a table, has no indexes. I'm going to write a record. There. Nice and quick, right? How many operations was that? I looked, I created, I wrote. The create actually is an IO operation in memory. It's moving stuff in memory. But it's still three operations. Cool. Now, I have four indexes. Keep track. That's three, right? Now, my index is over here. Boop, 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 boop. Does this apply to the index? Okay, where does it go in the index? Okay, put it in the index, write it to the disk. How many operations was that? Five. I'm going to come back over here. Oh, wait, there's another index. Uh, that's another five. Oh, there's an index. Oh, that one doesn't apply. Three. Because it still had to go check if it needed to do it.
Another five. And another five. Oh. Five, ten, thirteen, eighteen, twenty-three, plus three is twenty-six. And I'm keeping it simple. It's actually more than that. So that was 26 operations, and it took me a little while to take the round, right? Now I need to do that 10,000 times. Every index you add adds a little bit of overhead. Just a little. Right, you got Happy Go Lucky who created 10 indexes on a five, tab five column table. You're going to have at least three three IO operations for every index, whether or not it even needs to update the index. Don't create more indexes than you need because you're actually going to slow things down. Because as the right operations back up, so it's trying to do the first 10,000. While it's trying to do those 10,000, somebody else goes and posts another 5,000 rows. Those 5,000 have got to wait till the first 10,000 slow is done. It just snowballs. Now, nowadays it's not so bad because most servers are using high-speed, you know, SSDs or NVMe drives or whatever. Picture back in the day with mechanical drives and how fast that would be. Uh, but uh, you know, I'm being sarcastic when I use the word fast, right? It wasn't fast. So it would literally have to go to the draw hard drives and hit the hard drives and the hard drives heads are moving while it's reading data. We were very, very um, cheap with our indexes because of that. Okay, so those are three costs of indexes. There's one other cost-ish, maintenance. Not the human maintenance. Indexes can get stale. So you got a table with a million rows, but this table has a lot of create, insert, update, delete operations. So all the inserts are cool. They go in. All the updates go in. That's cool. The deletes, data's gone from the table. Data's taken out of the index, but now the index starts getting fragmented. Right? We suddenly have like whole blocks of the index unused because when it was first created, it was divided a certain way. Suddenly, we're getting rid of whole swaths, so we got entire sections of the index not being used anymore. We have to do called an index rebuild. 10,000 rows, a couple of seconds, million rows, a couple of minutes. Big data centers, hours. Um, that's another risk of having, and then you have five indexes. Each one's going to take a certain amount of time to rebuild. Um, so that's a you know ongoing issue where you have to rebuild the indexes. Good database servers maintain their indexes pretty well on their own. Like it does a defrag, so to speak. For those of us that remember defrag, when we had mechanical drives and we'd have to defrag it to try to get decent performance out of our mechanical drives, database servers defrag indexes where they'll clean up after themselves, but after a while they just get too dirty. And the database server, actually what it does is, as it uses the indexes, it keeps track of statistics and it realizes after a while that that index isn't going as fast as it used to. So then at, at night, when on during a low peak usage time, it'll actually trigger an index rebuild on its own. But while that index is being rebuilt, guess what you can't use? The index. Table scan time. You know, you're cleaning the toilet, you can't use the toilet while you're cleaning it. You got to wait till the same thing. Okay. So next week, I'll be talking about transactions. That will be on the mid on the final midterm, the final exam. There is no lab for it. Okay. Probably take me half an hour to cover this next topic, and then I'm going to be talking about uh, the final exam itself. So I'll be giving you guys the format, you know, a breakdown of what you need to read up, uh, what you should be practicing before you do the final exam. Um, and that's that. And then the week after, there, I'll be coming to class because I have to be here. 
There's nothing new. No new material. So if you have questions, it's a good time to come and ask questions. But there will be no new material after like next week. So the last class is totally optional to come. Uh, assignment two is due, because I had people ask me last class, December 3rd, demos are the week of the 4th in your lab period. You must demo. No demo equals. It rhymes. Yeah, no demo equals zero. You must demo what you submitted. Once you've submitted and the deadline has come and passed, even if you fix it, you're going to be graded on what you submitted. So make sure you get it right. And as everybody knows, the exam's on Saturday, on a Saturday at 8 a.m. Yay. S Go look at Axis. It's there, bruh. Should be. Saturday at 8 a.m. Do I look like I'm joking? No, it's it's gonna suck. So for those poor people stuck on OC Transpo, you might want to cough up some Uber money or find a ride. Just saying, because this is the one warning I give everybody about this. You're writing with all the other sections. Once one person leaves, if you're late and one person has left, you will not be allowed to write. If you are late and one person leaves before you walk in the door, you will not be allowed to start your exam. Be because you might have met them in the hall and they could give you a quick brain dump of what was on the exam. Absolutely. I don't expect anybody getting out of there in the first 30 minutes. Last semester, we did a just completely multiple choice exam. One guy was out in 14 minutes. No, he didn't. No, he had like a 78. So I'm like, I got nothing. So anyways, that's it for tonight, guys. Don't procrastinate on your assignment too. It can't be done in two hours.